In the previous videos, we've kind of discussed genetically modified organisms, but if you've noticed and you've caught on, I've said a couple of times genetic modification is nothing new. And I gave you an example of a tomato, and I gave you an example of a potato, and some other things like the golden rice as examples. But we're going to focus on genetic modification in a little bit more detail in this video in a history lesson. And I'm going to go back around 32,000 years ago. That's right, 32,000 years ago, we had a pack of documented wild wolves that joined a group of people in East Asia, right? And they just kind of hung out with the folks. I mean, they were there, they kind of rode along, they kind of scavenged along with those people, and they became somewhat of a road companion for these people. So the reason that I'm starting here is because these wild wolves ended up giving us domesticated dogs. These are dogs like pugs and chihuahuas and corgis, something that looks nothing like a wild wolf back 32,000 years ago. Now, the reason that I'm starting here is because these wild wolves could be our first documentation of a genetically modified organism. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there were no laboratories back in the day. I know that. We didn't stick these wild wolves with syringes and serums and solutions like you saw on that very first slide with that tomato and the DNA wrapped around it, but they were somewhat genetically modified, just in a different way. So, we're going to start having this conversation conversation about what we call natural selection and what we call artificial selection. And these wild wolves were artificially selected, or basically we intervened, all right? So probably what happened back in the day is these wild wolves, they all had different demeanors. Some maybe hung out with the humans a little bit more than others. So those demeanors were a very good indicator that these could become somewhat what we would call domesticated nowadays, right? So those ones with better demeanors basically had wild wolf babies, and those babies grew up with other humans, and they became even more domesticated. And over the years and years and years, different genetic variants began to show. So those genetic variants, maybe one of them had a shorter snout than the others. Maybe one of them was a little bit shorter than some of the others. And maybe, just maybe, some of those humans decided that they liked that particular trait. So they kept that offspring around. They made it that offspring with maybe another one that was very similar. And over a course of time, these genetic traits or deformities really became more pronounced. And this is how we ended up getting different lineages of canines or dogs and why they all look different even though they share the same type of ancestor. 32,000 years ago, we began playing with genetic modification. It was basically selective. It was basically artificial. Mother Nature did not come in. Mother Nature did not do this on her own. We just kind of helped it and we pushed it along a little bit more. And this is where we get that term artificial selection, right? We are intervening in this process and we are directing where we want this process to go. You know, Mother Nature would do this quite naturally in a way. It probably sounds horrible, but let's say two parents actually have a baby, whatever kind of baby that is, and whether this is two dog parents or two actual human parents, uh, they could have a baby and that baby could have a deformity. All right. Maybe that deformity is not a good one. And maybe that deformity is actually going to hurt that baby's chance of survival. And what happens is that Mother Nature kills it out. All right. But maybe just maybe that deformity is actually a good one. It actually plays a benefit in that particular line. 
okay? And whatever this might be, m maybe the eyeballs can see a little bit better at night, okay? So it actually increases the chance of survival for this baby and for future generations as well. So this trait becomes more pronounced over a course of time. This is something that we call natural selection. The genetic code is getting changed. That genetic code is getting modified by Mother Nature, not by me, not by you, not by a scientist in the lab. This is gen genetic modification at its finest, in its original state. Okay, Artificial selection, this is me intervening, and I am helping that process along, and I am genetically modifying all of the babies of the babies of the babies until I get something that I want maybe hundreds of years down the road. Who knows how long that's going to take, but it's both of these are a very slow process. All right, so 7800 BC, we actually find some archaeological sites that focused on wheat, not an animal. So if it can happen in an animal, it can happen in a plant, there is no difference. And this is our first sign of what we would regard as a domesticated wheat, not a domesticated dog, all right? So what do I mean by domesticated wheat? Well, I'll show you that in just a second, but this was just really our first encounter, all right? So it looks like these people ran across something that we regard as wheat, and maybe it wasn't perfect. Maybe they wanted to improve it. Maybe they wanted to make it better, and they did. And over a course of time, the actual product or the um, offspring of this wheat was a little bit better. Maybe it was a little bit bigger. Maybe it provided things that they wanted provided in their parents, but their parents just weren't able to produce it. So we get better, better, better in the wheat category. Well, the most dramatic here, and another one of the most common, is also corn. Okay, so corn and wheat are going to be the biggest, biggest changes over a course of time. You know, the very early signs of corn was nothing like what you would see corn with today in the grocery store. It didn't even look like corn today in the grocery store. They were very, very tiny ears. They had very few kernels on them. It was almost a waste back in the time. I mean, what could you actually do with something this scrawny? Well, over time, genetic modification happened, not in a laboratory, not with a syringe, not with a solution, nothing science-related, just simple, good old-fashioned cross-selection. Um, uh, over time, parents were chosen, they were uh, crossed, they provided offspring, that offspring had a change, that change was a positive change, and then as the years went by, this corn or this wheat changed slightly, little bit by little bit by little bit, and the genetic code also changed because of that. Again, this is a genetic modification, not the laboratory genetic modification that people associate with, but this again is a natural or an artificial selection, which is also a genetic modification. All right, so what do I mean by that? Give me some pictures. What are you really talking about? Well, here is basically an image of what we would call wild wheat over to the left versus a domesticated wheat, which is over on the right-hand side, and you can immediately see the difference, right? The difference here is that the uh, wild wheat as far as the grain is concerned, there's very little bit of grain that's associated with that stem, right? I mean, think about how many of these you would have to cut down and harvest in order to get grain that is workable uh, for you to make a different type of product with, okay? This is going to take tons. 
So why not make this a little bit bigger? Why not make this a product that could give me a little bit more grain so that way I don't have to work as hard? So over time, these were crossed, offspring happened, and what we ended up with were later domesticated varieties, like the one over here to the right-hand side. Look at all of the different grains that are associated with that particular stalk compared to the one on the left-hand side, right? This is not in day as far as product is concerned, but this is a genetic modification. I have changed the genetic code through the offspring over a course of years in order to give me a better workable product. One that I could basically harvest. It won't take as much. I'll get a lot of grain for each one. I mean, this is just perfect, right? Okay, well, these are real pictures of what we would identify as wheats and grains, right? And over to the left, you can basically see that the grains, they're there, right? There's nothing wrong with these. I mean, that's perfectly fine. And then you take a look at the pictures down here below and the zoom ins of what these grains look like. They're very rigid. They're very rugged. They're not really uniform. I don't get a lot per stalk. And then you take a look over here on the right hand side and there's tons more grain that's going to be found in these. And then when you look at them closer up, these grains are very uniform. They're very smooth. I'll get a lot of them. So again, it is an improved product at no point in time. At no point in time have you probably thought about wheat in that particular way. Wheat is genetically modified, all right? It's naturally or artificially genetically modified, and it's not getting done in a lab, but this is genetic modification, just like you. You are a genetic modification. You're a genetic modification of your parents. Hopefully, you received the good traits from each one, and those good traits are in you, and the bad traits are not. And if so, then we have an improved product. And then, as you have children, and as you grow older, you hope to pass the good traits only to your children, and you leave the bad traits behind. There is no difference. That is genetic modification, all right, or part of it. Well, we also talked about corn. Here's corn over the series of the timeline that corn has been around. Of course, over to the right-hand side, this is what we associate with corn. But in the beginning, it looked pretty much like a turd. All right, so that corn, that is how corn really started out. What can you do with that? I mean, could you imagine if I told you to go into the grocery store and buy this thing and we're going to go roast it on a grill at the summertime and slather it in butter? There's no way. I mean, this is just ridiculous. But there was something about this that we liked. But it needed improvement. So over time, these were crossed offspring happened and we ended up with a slightly better product and then it re then it got better and better and better and better and as you notice the ear of corn gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and as far as the flavor goes we figured out that consumers really prefer sweet corn. So over time this corn has gotten sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. You would probably recognize this if you ever bought something like corn at Trader Joe's versus corn at Harris Teeter or Food Line or any other grocery store that's around. If you purchase corn at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods, what you would typically notice is that the taste of that corn is going to be a little bit different. It's not as sweet. It's almost kind of bitter and somebody would bite down into it and they would kind of take a second look and think that the corn was probably rotten. But that is kind of corn at its heart. And the sweet, sweet hybridized corn is basically a genetic modification of it. So this is nothing that's uncommon. It's something that's in the grocery store. You might not have ever recognized that, but this is wild corn versus domesticated corn or corn that we have helped to become genetically modified over a course of years. Uh, another picture I want you to look at is this one. Okay, so if I take a look at this, this is a 
uh, product that is sold in the grocery store. I don't know if you'll be able to uh, name it or not. It really depends on, uh, you know, how much cooking that you do at home and how many times you go into the grocery store and go over to the produce section. But this is an article that is sold in the grocery store every single day. The problem is that this is the original state of that item. This is really its natural state of how it used to be before genetic modification came along. We liked this produce. It tasted very sweet. We liked the texture of it. We were able to do a lot of things with it as far as cooking is concerned, but it needed improvement. What kind of improvement did it need? Well, it went from this to this. There is your genetic modification. That's right, bananas have been genetically modified over a course of years to give us a better product. Again, not in a laboratory. I mean, we've not taken this thing into a lab to create this, but we have been able to play around with a little bit of genetics over time and a little bit of DNA over time, and we have been able to selectively pick the pro or the offspring that we want in order to produce a common banana. All right, here's another one. This is also sold in the grocery store. This is its natural state, grows right off the vine. Uh, the issue here is the very top piece. Uh, we didn't really like the way that it grew. So all of these thorns and little prickly things up here at the very top. I mean, this is very difficult to harvest. I mean, you would hurt your hands all the time if this is what you had to deal with. Not only the thorns and the pricklies were there, but if you notice, they were also on the stems as well. I mean, think of this as digging in a rose bush, trying to get these little things, right? So the issue is that this is the natural state, but once again, we liked the texture, we liked the taste. There were a couple of things that we could have done with this if we just let it grow a little bit easier and if we could harvest it a little bit easier. So over years, we slightly changed and we slightly modified this picture that you're seeing. And if you are a produce purchaser, well, this item is actually this an eggplant that's right this is the old timey eggplant and this is how it used to grow right or how it used to grow so this eggplant basically has become a little bit bigger there's become a little bit more meat inside of the flesh we can do a little bit more things with it uh, and we could actually improve the flavor and the texture of it as well just like in the banana I mean could you imagine buying a banana and getting into all of these seeds that's on the inside nobody would want that just imagine how disgusting that would be well the same thing is going to happen to an eggplant it's really been genetically modified we've picked and chose the offspring and we allowed those offspring to basically have other little eggplant babies and over time this is what we've ended up with all right well here's another one this is the original state and this original state again it was okay i mean there was nothing exciting about this uh, honestly if you want my advice this looks like a ginseng root that you would dig up from the ground and maybe sell people sell ginseng root uh, in some type of herbal supplement all right well if you take a look at this you maybe will be able to figure out what this thing is, but look how rooty it is. All right, look at all the stems that are coming from it. It's very little. It's scrawny. Uh, there's hardly anything that you can do with it. Uh, once you take off the outside edges of it, you're going to have very little left over to do what you need to do with it. So over a course of time, this somewhat sweet root... Uh, that was dug up from the ground actually changed into this. That is your old Tommy Carrot, right? So this thing goes here because of these artificial selections that I'm doing to try to get a better, bulkier, better tasting, better textured product. All right. So once again, genetic modification has happened here, not in a laboratory, but by either natural or artificial selection. Here's another example. This is an old timey peach. 
All right. If you take a look at the old timey natural peach, what you'll find is 64% of it is what we would call edible and 36% of it was an actual stone. And the stone is that really hard pit on the inside of a peach. So 64 and 36, one third is wasted on that really hard stone that you can't do anything with. In addition to that, the outside layer of this peach was very waxy. Okay, so I don't know if you've ever had of a uh, had a muscadon grape, but that muscadon grape on the outside is very tough and it's very waxy and it's very chewy. And this old fashioned peach was basically the same way. Look at the size of it too, 25 millimeters. And the taste up here at the very top is reported as earthy, otherwise meaning tastes like dirt sometimes. Sweet, sour and slightly salty. Okay, so imagine going out and maybe putting like a piece of starburst in your mouth and a, and a handful of sand. I mean, that's what this thing will probably taste like. It's kinda good, but over time it needed improvement. Well, what did we improve it to? Well, we improved it to something that looks like this. This is our natural peach today. So this peach is 90% edible now versus the two thirds, we're nine tenths. So almost 100%, but we could do a little bit more work and a 10% stone. So by far and large, we are getting more edible part of the fruit. In addition to that, we got rid of this waxy skin. A lot of people did not like the waxy skin. Again, they thought it was very tough. They thought it was kind of rubbery. So what we decided to do is change the skin to something that's soft and very edible. So you sink your teeth into it like an apple, right? If you can get by the little fuzzy part kind of, well, this flesh uh, and the outside layer is very edible and some people enjoy it. In addition to that, look at the size difference. We started off at 25 millimeters and here we are at 100 millimeters now. This is 65 times larger than the traditional run of the mill peach back in the day, okay? All right, so if we take a look, 64 times larger, 27% juicier, 4% sweeter. Overall, it's a better product. And I would have to say that if you were given a choice to go into the grocery store and buy a peach and you were given the option of this or this, you would choose this one, right? If you went into the grocery store and you were told to buy a carrot and you were given a choice of this one or this one, you would probably gravitate and do that one, right? It makes perfect common sense. If you were told to go in and buy a banana from the grocery store and you had two choices, this one or this one, you would probably go in, I would hope, and purchase this as the banana. And when you're doing that, you're buying genetically modified produce. You probably just didn't or weren't not aware of it when you did it, but you did. Here is a picture of the watermelon. 1645 versus now, all right? Uh, the old watermelon, the more natural kind of state watermelon was hundreds of years ago. It was mainly this wattage part that you did not like to eat in a normal watermelon today. We eat the pink part, the red part. We leave all of that kind of harder white watermelon rind behind. Well, it was mostly rind on the inside. It was mostly that texture on the inside with little splurts of red watermelon throughout it, right? Well, who wants to dig just for that little bitty edible part that we enjoyed? Why not make a better product? Why not make a bigger product? Why not make a sweeter product that is more of that pinkish stuff that we enjoy and less of the harder, maybe more bitter rind part that we do not enjoy. And that's exactly what we did. So over a course of hundreds of years, we received offspring. That offspring was crossed and it kept getting crossed in order to change the genetic makeup of a watermelon. So when you bought into one of these in the summer, June or July, Think of genetic modification because that's exactly what has happened.
So I keep talking about this natural selection versus artificial selection. And what I want you to take away from this are the differences between the two. I keep using them interchangeably, but they are different. So natural selection, it's natural, of course. This is without interference from us, and Mother Nature will do this on her own. Uh, they are targeting traits, and that will typically increase the survival of that particular species. So as that eggplant is growing, that trait, if it's natural selection, if there is a modification, if there is what we would maybe regard a deformity, if that deformity aids in the survival of that eggplant, then it typically will stay behind and it will be passed down to its offspring from that point on. We often call this survival of the fittest. Again, it's been around for ages and we just automatically associate it as natural evolution kind of taking place on its own. All right. Artificial selection is over on the right-hand side. These are desired traits, but not by Mother Nature, but by humans. We are interfering in this process. We are picking and choosing what we want. We are crossbreeding these as we need to in order to get the offspring that's the desired product. It doesn't enhance the survival. All right. And the reason is because we're not necessarily interested in that. OK, we are interfering. We are harvesting these crops or these animals, for that matter, goes. And we want to ensure that the traits that we want are showcased, not if we just allow this thing to go roam or grow in the wild. That is the natural selection. That is not the artificial selection side. OK, in the middle, these are areas that they share in common, and that's why they're taking place in both circles. So traits are inherited from parents. That is typically where all of these are coming from. We are not creating anything new and inserting that into the product in natural or artificial selection. In addition to that, we do get genetic traits that are changed. So natural selection is changing the genes and the DNA, and artificial selection is doing the same thing. And in both of these cases, this could take many generations. It could take many, many, many ancestors to go by before we get to that very final product of what we're after. But over a course of time, we actually see slight improvements with every single uh, tree branch, if that's what you want to call it as far as the family tree is concerned, um, with the lineage. All right. Now, where does GMO fit? What is GMO? Is it taking place in one circle or the other? What exactly is it and how is it different? Well, I guess to clear the matter up, a lot of people think of GMO as a separate category, and it should be, I guess, but this genetic modification they are referring to as something different, all right? Natural selection is genetic modification, and artificial selection is genetic modification. Otherwise, we can't get changes in the genes, and we can't get changes in the product. So genetic modification is happening with both of these. But when people talk about genetically modified organisms or GMOs, they're really not referring to these two selection types. All right, What they are referring to is a different category, and of course it's called genetic modification or genetic engineering. And genetic engineering is really regarded as a third circle. And this is us in a laboratory doing things to accelerate this process. Okay, uh, We are very impatient people, and we don't want to wait around. We want genetic offspring, and we want those offspring quick. So genetic engineering is going to go in and make these modifications that we are wanting, that we are after, and it's going to do it automatically. And it is going to skip maybe hundreds or thousands of years in order to get to that point. So go back and think about the dogs that we started with, right? Those packs of wild wolves 
we could bring one of those into the laboratory, we could extract the DNA, we could modify that DNA, we could change the DNA in order to get traits that we want, and then we could reinsert that DNA back into a growing offspring that would then be birthed and be what we want. We have just rushed the timeline. That is what genetic engineering is. All right. So this is genetic material and genetic material, of course, is referring to DNA, RNA and proteins that we will talk more about later on in the lecture videos of an individual. And it has been modified. And this modification is due to biotechnology and in particular genetic engineering. All right. So you've often maybe heard of this hot button word called biotechnology. It has a lot to do with genes and proteins and DNA. And this is basically the field that biotechnology lives in. An organism produced through genetic engineering is a genetically modified organism and GMOs can contain genetic material from unrelated species. Notice up here in the natural selection and artificial selection, we never really talked about cross species DNA. Okay, that's kind of a really hot button word. At no point in time, if you think about that potato, that potato had potato DNA and that potato DNA was pulled from other potatoes of things that they liked and did not like. Well, genetic engineering, it doesn't stop there. In genetic engineering, we can actually go to one species, let's say in a bacteria, and we like the trait that that bacteria produces, and that bacteria's DNA could be genetically encoded into a produce, like a vegetable. And that vegetable could take in the bacteria DNA, and now all of a sudden we get a completely different type of vegetable. Maybe it looks the same, maybe it tastes the same, but the genetic code is different at this point. This is what causes the controversy with genetic modified organisms. This is why they show you those images of the beakers and the test tubes and the syringes like they do here. And the reason is because genetic engineering and genetic modification has not had a very good rap as far as publicity goes. People that are uneducated in the field honestly believe that we are injecting crops with liquid solutions and these liquid solutions are staying in the produce and the fruit and the vegetable and we are eating that literally. They're uninformed. They're not educated on GM products. Here's another image. Again, you're seeing the same thing. Let's bring some produce in a lab. Let's put a needle in it because people are afraid of needles. So if people see this image, it makes them scared. It looks like something sciencey is going on, and it looks like something that I don't want. I mean, this is kind of like that weird apple in Snow White. Who wants to take a bite of that, right? I mean, the evil queen is going to send this my way to tell me to take a bite of it, and then it's going to poison me and put me to sleep. No, absolutely not. This is not what goes on in a laboratory with genetic modification. But this is the images. These are the images that they are providing to you in order to tell you that genetic modification is bad. Well, the truth of the matter is genetic modification has been around. It's been around in a couple of different forms, natural selection, artificial selection, and now actually genetic engineering that is done in a laboratory without a syringe. And over time, GMO products have become so common that if you eat any one of these items, you probably are eating genetically modified crops. Over 94% of soybean product has been genetically modified. 90% of canola has been genetically modified. 
88% of corn has been genetically modified and 90% of cotton has been genetically modified. I hope that you're not eating cotton. That's done for a different reason. But in the food realm, corn, soybean, and canola are very common GM products. GMO, genetically modified organisms, but here we're talking about GM food, genetically modified food. Why are these the target? We'll talk about those a little bit later. But canola, well, I can go ahead and mention canola because chances are you've done a canola lab experiment in one of our classes in the 115 class. And the reason that canola is a target is because canola, or rape seed, had a large amount of urusic acid. And urusic acid was basically a poison. It was something that we did not want, all right? It was mutagenic, carcinogenic. So this urusic acid level needs to be lower. So we genetically modify the rape seed. And we genetically modify it in order to make a uh, product um, that will grow that will have less amount of urusic acid, and this is our modified canola that we now use for a number of different reasons. In addition to this, you also need to look out for labels because this is a common label that you're probably going to be seeing. This label it says non-GMO project. Uh, the reason that this label started going on the products is because these companies thought that consumers were getting wiser and consumers were getting more in tune with hot topic words. And one of these was GMO. And it looked like consumers did not have a very positive experience with the term GMO. Even though they knew very little about it, it was a word that they just wanted to stay away from. So genetically modified organism, whenever you just say it that way, it's just weird and people are uncomfortable with it, right? So they began to stamp non-GMO project as a bragging right. You know, hey, by us, we're not genetically modified. Well, the truth of the matter is you're already eating genetically modified organisms. When you buy that banana, when you buy that tomato... When you buy that apple, when you buy the corn, you're already eating genetically modified things. It's genetically modified in a different way, but it's still genetically modified. So this term is actually too loose. This non-GMO, they are talking about genetic engineering. They're talking about taking that product into a laboratory and actually doing things with it science-related. That's what they're referring to. But quite honestly, again, everything is genetically modified. So this label is actually useless. Who cares about this label, right? I mean, again, if I go back to the rice story, that's genetically modified. It was genetically modified to do something good, and then it was destroyed. Well, yeah, that was genetically modified, but what was bad about it? Okay? That tomato, we removed a protein. That's all that we did. We removed a protein that made it mushy. We didn't go in and splice it. We didn't go in and inject it with a needle full of unknown liquid. We simply removed the code to have it make the protein that made it mush. So it stayed on your counter a little bit longer. What's so bad about that? That label, non-GMO, they're telling you that's bad. The potato that we cut open, that didn't turn brown as fast, that had lower amount of asparagine in it, right? That then turned around and made lower levels of acrylamide, which was a carcinogenic compound. Well, that was a GM-modified organism. Okay, well, this label, non-GMO, is going to tell you that was a bad thing to do. You shouldn't buy that potato because it's been a GM product. Does that really make sense to you? If it doesn't, then you need to start taking a look at this label as you see it on products when you buy them in the store and kind of snicker. Because GM products are not all bad. Now, some of them might be. 
but not all of them are bad. And in addition to that, you're probably eating genetically modified organisms anyway. So once more, that label is kind of silly. This is all advertisement. It's all a scheme for the consumer. That's all that it is. It's a product that can have some bragging rights that say, I'm not genetically modified. They put the stamp on the bag, and someone that's not really trained in the world of genetic engineering or genetic modification would look at that label and say, oh, it makes me feel good. I see a butterfly. It makes me feel good because it says non-GMO. So they're selling to Whole Foods, and they sell it for, you know, four or five times more expensive than what I could buy this other product for, but I'm going to buy it because it makes me feel good. There's a butterfly on it. Yay! So in the next video, we'll pick up from here, and we'll talk about the history of the GMO. How did it get started? What are some of the first genetically modified food products that I and need to pay attention to? And what's the timeline of these things? When did it start? How long did it last? Is it still going on? And butterflies. Yay!